very warm welcome from my side for Medical Affairs from Fire Medical to this third webinar in a row about respiratory diagnostic topics. And now the, the topic is understanding 2017 uh, ERS ATS medical link guidelines and how to implement this in your pulmonary function lab. I'm very happy that I can, um, that, that we found uh, Dr. Franz de Jong uh, as a presenter of this, who is one of the authors of this publication. And due to the time, oh, one, more, one important thing is uh, at the end of the presentation, which will take almost 45, 50 minutes, there will be room for questions, of course. So uh, save your questions for the last 15 minutes. And then I give the microphone to uh, Franz de Jong. Yeah, I think, uh, Herman, thank you. I think they can put the questions also in the chat and then uh, during the talk, so they don't have to uh, wait till the end, but uh, I will answer the questions after 45 minutes at the end. Yes, you're right. Yeah, yeah. we will see the questions in the chat. Okay, okay so thank you uh, for this opportunity to talk about this uh, guideline. Uh, guideline, uh, a lot of papers, a lot of uh, texts, and uh, this uh, guideline took us quite long. Uh, my name is Van de Jong, I'm a pulmonary physiologist uh, working at uh, three different places, as you can see on this first slide. I'm heading a pulmonary function lab in Amsterdam, which is a big city at the east side of the Netherlands, but at the same height of Amsterdam. Uh, I also work in the academic medical uh, hospital of Amsterdam itself, uh, the AMC hospital, but there at the neonatal intensive care ward, trying to measure lung function for this premature neonates. And uh, moreover, I have, have a technical background uh, at, uh, and working at the University of Technology. Uh, I have no conflict of interest to declare but I am a board member of many societies and the most well-known might be the European Respiratory Society in which I had the honor to uh, be secretary and head of 79, the Allied Health Professionals in which group 9.1 is the lung function. Uh, but also Dutch uh, respiratory societies. Uh, I'm of course uh, one of the uh, staff members of the lung function uh, questions or pulmonary physiology uh, groups. Um, and I'm, uh, I have been involved in several uh, guidelines at this moment. Uh, I am a director uh, of uh, assessment director of the ERS. Uh, therefore, I was director e-learning of the ERS. So I have a lot of uh, things for the European Investment Society. And we uh, started to make a new uh, guideline. Why did we uh, start? Well, we started in 2010. That's already 11 years ago. Because worldwide, there were not yet uh, standards. The most up-to-date uh, document uh, was uh, quite old. So we uh, formed a list of experts. And you can here see all the people which were involved in this task force uh, on an um, alphabetical order uh, and uh, people might recognize that our uh, persons uh, well perhaps uh, well perhaps I know several of them are now retired uh, but there are European experts uh, and there are American experts um, and uh, um, uh, Bruce Gulf and Alan Coates Alan Coates is the first author of the task force paper uh, were the ATS uh, chairs and uh, Peter Sturk who wrote the 1993 guideline and myself uh, were the European chairs of this uh, task force well why uh, we wanted to uh, fit uh, three documents into one uh, and uh, the European one was the oldest one that was uh, from Peter Sturk himself uh, uh, about 30 pages, uh, Airway of Responsiveness, but it was a part of this uh, report. The yeah, Americans had, uh, by Krapo and all, uh, documents in the Blue Journal of, uh, in 2000. And the Europeans had, by GEOs and other documents, only dealing with indirect airway challenges. Uh, and you can see the amount of pages those uh, task force, the papers did have, or sorry, this uh, uh, reports did have. And uh, we uh, needed to make, uh, let's say, a kind of uh, a new uh, guideline, ERS ATS. Uh, and uh, as you know, nowadays uh, we want to have less words and less spaces. So that was a huge uh, challenge. And uh, at the end, uh, it came out that uh, after this uh, long time, but, but this paper now is already a few years old due to COVID, it seems still 
quite fresh and new. We uh, made uh, two uh, papers, one about the direct challenges and one about the indirect challenges. Why did we want to combine three documents and make a worldwide uh, document? Uh, well, uh, the documents uh, described nebulizers for nebulizing histamine or metacoline, which were not available anymore. It mentioned an old white nebulizer, uh, and that was not available on the market anymore. And what we uh, found out is that uh, each country, uh, everybody used their own nebulizer and everybody used own settings. Mostly uh, they were uh, when they were, let's say, installed in the hospital by the manufacturer, there were some settings uh, made and people worked like that the whole uh, life. The second thing is that uh, in many countries uh, still use histamine, but uh, histamine is not uh, GMP approved, so not good manufactured practice approved in the USA. So if you wanted to have a worldwide document for the ERS and the ATS, we should uh, all switch over to meet the goal line and uh, see what consequences that uh, would uh, have. And last but not least, uh, uh, when we started with this task force, a dry powder called Manitol was also FDA approved. And people thought at that time that uh, many of these uh, provocation tests could be uh, done by uh, Manitol uh, as being a new, uh, more, let's say, simple uh, method to do a bronchial provocation. Uh, but, uh, uh, and therefore, uh, the uh, Metacola and histamine test might become outdated. Uh, however, um, uh, Manitol, although it's still uh, FDA approved, uh, also has its uh, downsides uh, and it didn't uh, take over uh, the Metacola and histamine provocation tests. Difficulty, another difficulty or challenge, I should say, uh, for making up a task force is that uh, any uh, committee nowadays worldwide wants you to use the GRADE system. G-R-A-D, as uh, here you can see on the top, states that uh, your uh, document is based on double-blind, uh, placebo-controlled, multi-centric studies, uh, which, uh, let's say, uh, prove that method A is better than method B or device A is even better than device B or a certain setting of device A works better than a certain setting uh, on uh, that same device A. And as you can imagine, this is totally impossible. Everybody uses his own nebulizers, own settings. And uh, nobody uh, says, well, I want to see for my patients this bronchial hyperresponsiveness. Uh, if uh, they have the same outcome, if I uh, go to another nebulization scheme or different nebulizer or different concentrations. So it means that if you cannot use the grade system uh, your, uh, and your uh, document is based on expert opinion and the best what we think we can write down, uh, we can uh, mostly only go for recommendations. So we'll see that in the document, uh, often uh, or only, I would only say the word recommendation is used uh, because if you only have, if you have a stronger evidence, a better proof made by the grade system, then uh, you really can say that you should or must do something. In this case, we can only say we recommend that you do something. Okay, uh, I already said we had uh, two uh, time of different uh, ways uh, to do bronchial provocation tests. And uh, the big difference is there are direct tests and indirect tests. Uh, if you have a direct uh, stimulus, uh, then you directly influence the uh, smooth muscles around the airways and it can give a bronchial constriction. If you have an indirect uh, stimulus, uh, then it will uh, trigger uh, cells, uh, mostly intermediate cells, which will release uh, uh, all kind of um, uh, chemical compounds, which uh, on their uh, way uh, will influence the airway smooth muscle cells. And to make it more uh, clear, uh, the direct stimuli are uh, metacoli and histamine, and uh, two other ones which are seldom used or only for studies. Indirect stimuli are uh, way more, uh, uh, and also more done perhaps, exercise tests or uh, eucapnic hyperventilation tests is called dry air. Manitol is also an indirect stimulus, and then you have hyper or hypertonic saline and the other ones with some uh, 
um, chemical formulations. What is the big difference and why are, do people use direct and indirect stimuli? In my last slides, I will also uh, give some more um, uh, details. This is, in my opinion, a very nice uh, 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 slide. Uh, I see, I didn't even mention the, where it comes from, but I hope everybody knows this uh, uh, slide. Um, if you have an indirect stimulus, like exercise or academic hyperventilation or dryer, then you have this total cascade of things which you do trigger. You start uh, by uh, breathing uh, fast, then you evaporate, uh, you dry out your airways, you get water loss in your airways, so your mucosa becomes drier, it will increase uh, the concentrations of uh, nature, uh, chloride, calcium, calcium, and uh, diam or potassium is called in English, uh, I thought. Uh, and uh, uh, therefore, it will increase the osmolarity. And uh, then at the end, you will see it uh, re uh, gives the bron bronchial smooth muscle contraction. However, if you uh, have uh, hypertonic aerosols and stimuli, you directly change the Osmolarity, and you only have the last five points of this cascade of effects. And if you use AMP, it's only the last three. And if you use beta coline or histamine, you are directly only uh, uh, affecting the bronchial smooth muscle. So the uh, amount of things which you do trigger uh, by uh, the test you choose for uh, will uh, give different outcomes. And we will see later on that the sensitivity and specificity for direct and indirect tests are highly different. So uh, in uh, this uh, uh, talk, I will uh, mostly uh, concentrate. This is a direct uh, stimulation uh, test, and I will talk about beta coline in direct assembly. At the time that uh, we uh, uh, were working on this test, the three mentioned in white here were the most uh, used. Well, one of the things uh, we, of course, investigated was uh, that uh, is it really such a problem that people use different kind of nebulization systems? Uh, and uh, as long as the output is uh, the same, uh, does it give different outcomes? And this is a study uh, in uh, 2013, which was uh, halfway during our task force, which uh, they studied uh, meter coline with tidal breathing uh, and uh, with the correct output with the two different nebulizers. And the old nebulizer, which was uh, in the old uh, guideline, uh, stated that you should write, use the right nebulizers. And if you uh, put it on the correct setting, the, we found out, or people did know already, Don Cockcroft uh, uh, was uh, perhaps one of the first to know, that the MMAD, the mass medium aerodynamic diameter, of, was only one micron. Uh, well, if you use the Aeronap Pro, uh, then your uh, di diameter of your particles uh, will be three micron. And if you use it in a different uh, setting, uh, it uh, can produce also particles of five micron. And of course, then you should shorten your nebulization time if you want to have the same output, the same amount of concentrations nebulized uh, for a certain patient. And there they tested it in eight patients uh, with an average of 25 years. A bit, uh, a bit, uh, let's say, a bit of persons is known uh, um, uh, airway hyper responsiveness, of course. And then they uh, looked uh, where the PC20 was uh, when they have the same patients having these three types of uh, nebulization, one times with uh, the right and two times with the Aeronet Pro in two different settings. And you can see on this uh, slide uh, that uh, the uh, influence was. Uh, highly different, that the PC20 was highly different for these three outcomes, and that if you uh, used the right nebulizer in the old uh, settings, that you could uh, nebulize uh, 6.3 milligrams per milliliter before you reached uh, a PC20, so uh, the lower uh, the, uh, a lower average one, 20% uh, lower than uh, starting this, uh, than if you use uh, particles of 5 micro. Then you can see there was a tenfold difference in the amount of uh, uh, meter coline which was uh, nebulized simply because you used a different nebulizer. If you use a nebulizer with smaller particles, it uh, will not uh, um, uh, deposit that much in the more uh, central air airways where the 
smooth muscle cells are present. So your outcome is highly different. And on the right graph, you can see how it was per individual. In this slide, it is perhaps even more striking. Here we again see the eight individuals. Uh, and we can see in the red lines, this was if the, the person was nebulized with one micron particles with the white nebulizer. The blue lines is three micron particles, and the five uh, uh, micron particles are in green. And you can see uh, on the vertical axis how much the fall in the FEV1 uh, is. And you see that for some patients, like subject number one, there isn't that much difference. Uh, but you see, for instance, in subject number three, that if you use one micron particles, and note that this is a, a, not a linear scale, but a logarithmic scale, that the amount of uh, uh, um, um, amount of uh, aerosols which you do nebulize uh, is way higher than if you use a three or five micron particles. So, uh, and also here, subject number seven, you see a huge difference at subject number six. Uh, uh, about which nebulizer you use and in which setting you use that nebulizer. Another study which uh, 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 saw, uh, yeah, uh, uh, gave us a new importance also from uh, that uh, time uh, uh, was that uh, if we think that uh, we know the characteristics of a nebulizer, the nebulizer uh, might have a different output depending on how it operates. Here you see uh, a nebulizer which was on 1.5 bar, so the pressurized on 1.5 bar, but it was simply, simply nebulizing and there was no suction of a patient or a simulated patient. And then it was operated at a flow, it, it then gave a flow of seven liters per minute, which was the correct setting for this nebulizer, but the output was 0.24 milliliters per minute. But if you lower the pressure, then the output is also lowered and your particle size will become higher. And if you lower the pressure, but you start to simulate with a patient breathing at 30 liters per minute, this is a bit high, but as soon as a patient has a mouthpiece in the mouth, you will easily get uh, something like 20 liters per minute. Then you can see that this, on the same setting, the output again increases from 0.13 milliliters per minute to 0.19 milliliters per minute. So it uh, even depends, uh, the output of your nebulizer does depend if there is a patient breathing or a simulated breathing uh, patient on that nebulizer or not. And also the particle size, which you can see in this left bottom graph, strongly depends on the uh, uh, output of the, uh, of the pressure setting of the nebulizer. You can see that if uh, you uh, use it at 1.5 bar, this typical nebulizer, then the uh, average particle size was about 5 micron. And the 5 micron, we'll see later on, is already uh, more or less the upper limit in which we think uh, is usable. And if you lower the pressure, then the particles will become bigger, and these kind of particles mostly will end up in your throat, you will swallow them, and they will end up in your stomach. So uh, it uh, is a huge difference in uh, what kind of particles you will uh, get uh, for the different settings. So yes, setup does influence outcome, and an ideal test uh, should be safe, cheap, and easy to perform uh, for uh, uh, patients as well as for clinicians and uh, lab technicians. We also were uh, very aware of what kind of outcome should we take uh, to uh, in this new document, in this new task force, because already in the 1993 uh, document, uh, people stated that forced oscillation techniques, FOT uh, abbreviated, might uh, be more uh, 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 subtle and more discriminative to see if we have a reaction, an increased area resistance, than an FEV1 is. Uh, and it's already hinting a bit in this direction. And there have been let's say, uh, I think, uh, uh, at least uh, 20 papers in which some kind of different outcome measure than the FEV1 is used to measure airway hyperreactivity. It might be the force oscillation technique. It might be flow measures from the flow volume curve. It might be resistance uh, of the respiratory systems or the, the 
uh, measured by the body platysmograph. It might be if you have nitrogen wash washout tests, uh, the S conductive and S SNR or uh, lung clearance index. So there were all kinds of studies, uh, smaller studies stating that other techniques might be more sensible in uh, seeing if your airways do respond on this provocative agent like beta coline, uh, then simply wait till the FEV1 is 20% lower. However, uh, the uh, 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 papers were so heterogeneous, there were such differences in that we couldn't find a common usable outcome. And I uh, have to admit that therefore we, in this new paper, only use the FEV1 as golden standard. But as people might know, resistance uh, for laminar flow in a tube depends on the fourth power of the diameter of that tube. So a small change in airway diameter, 10% uh, change will uh, easily give a 1.1, so 1.1, 10% higher than 1, to the power of 4, it's a 50% change in airway resistance. So resistance might be a more sensitive outcome, however, it also is uh, highly sensitive to all kinds of other fluctuations, and uh, the, your standard deviations will also be easily uh, treated four times higher than for the FEV1. And therefore, we uh, state on the FEV1. Here you see the uh, task force. And uh, I hope that if you uh, followed uh, this uh, um, webinar, uh, you have uh, got the main points. But uh, if not, uh, I would all recommend uh, download the task force. It's for free. ERES and ATS always state that these kind of documents are so important that they put them for free on the internet so everybody can uh, read and download uh, them. Uh, and um, uh, what we uh, uh, were uh, challenging is um, uh, when, well, let's say I perhaps uh, missed one step, when do you use uh, a direct or an indirect challenge test? Well, you simply want uh, to, you do spirometry, the person, uh, the patient has complaints of things that might look like asthma, bronchial hyperactivity, are your airway hyper responsiveness, uh, as we consequently uh, uh, called it in our task force as being the most optimal way in describing this phenomenon. Um, airway hyper responsiveness, um, uh, if you simply see by administering a beta 2 that your FEV1 increases more than 12%, then you don't have to do such a test in general, then that is more than enough. But if your patient has complaints, uh, uh, which uh, could be related to airway hyper responsiveness, and you don't uh, see reversibility on your uh, beta 2, then you might think, I, do I want to have a bronchial challenge test, an airway hyper responsiveness test, and do I want to have a direct test or an indirect test? And I'll come to that later. Uh, what is the uh, advantages or disadvantages. Of course, there are contraindications, and that's on these uh, slides. Uh, the contraindications can be uh, uh, seen, of course, in uh, the document. Um, uh, people should uh, be able to blow a spirometry because otherwise you cannot uh, see if the FEV1 is 20% lower. And when they start the test, uh, their uh, FEV1 should be higher or uh, than 60% of uh, predicted uh, for Anderson uh, children or uh, uh, more than 1.5 liter. Uh, and if you go for an Indirect uh, test, then you uh, give something like the maximal dose uh, for as, as if you would do a direct test, because in a challenge test for uh, an exercise, you don't stop normally halfway to see if the FEV1 is already lowered. So then you, it's uh, the same as doing a direct test, uh, almost starting with the highest dose. Well, if you do a direct, uh, therefore an indirect test, the boundary uh, is uh, chosen as being that the FEV1 at the start should be. Uh, uh, should be higher than 75% of predicted. Uh, the second slide of contraindications are cardiovascular problems and there are some general problems that uh, the person should know and be able to perform the maneuvers, so, uh, such as blowing an FEV1 uh, and uh, uh, inhaling, uh, 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 well, hopefully in a tight breathing way, uh, the medication uh, given. Also in this uh, uh, task uh, 
uh, force paper, you will see a part in uh, what uh, uh, the personnel performing this test should be qualified for. Uh, and that's something which uh, I thought so important that I put it in the slideshow. We see that sometimes uh, nowadays uh, um, spirometry is going to the first line and uh, 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 also in the, let's say, less experienced people, therefore sometimes do perform tests when experienced people are not there, uh, like CO diffusion or exercise tests or even bombshell challenge tests. And of course, if, if your personal is trained for this, and you can read uh, here in these three points what your personal should be able to do, then it's fine to do it. But be aware uh, that uh, uh, you should do this test only if uh, you are familiar with all uh, the safety and emergency procedures, know when to do stop testing, know uh, how to handle uh, a patient which gets a severe uh, bongo constriction uh, and simply uh, know everything of this document. Um, if you do the test, uh, there is uh, some medication should be uh, 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 stopped for some time and it's in this slide that you can see which medication should be stopped for how many hours and uh, in blue under this uh, slide you can read why uh, this, uh, that you can find why we chose these times for these kind of uh, medications. Uh, there is one exception. Sometimes people uh, do want to test uh, while uh, the patient is, is under his regular long or short acting beta 2 medication because they want to know if uh, the patient still is hyperreactive when he or she takes his normal medication. But then it's not for diagnosing if you have airway hyperresponsiveness, then it's to see if uh, the amount of medication which the patient takes normally is the correct amount. That's a different question. Uh, another document which is in the supplement B, because there are some online supplements, is that uh, especially in uh, the USA and Canada, uh, a questionnaire should be filled in a pretest questionnaire and an example is given. As you see many lines, small lines, I will not read them, but if you uh, are performing these tests, please want to read the questionnaire and see uh, if you should not also uh, use this as a standard questionnaire in your own lab. I know uh, that uh, many labs are still lacking in uh, doing so. Um, another thing is that in some uh, uh, countries, uh, everything should also be, uh, um, uh, a, a consent form should be uh, filled in. And uh, again, in the supplement, uh, the, uh, an example of a consent form is uh, given. And this is a sample of consent form used in uh, Canada and the USA, uh, which uh, the uh, uh, patient or a guardian should sign if uh, the patient uh, wants to have a bronchial challenge test. Back uh, to the technique. This was this, uh, let's say, uh, older uh, English white nebulizers, which on the uh, normal settings produ produced particles which were too small and which uh, about one micron and uh, where uh, that was one of the reasons that we had to adapt our old documents. This is another one which we did uh, uh, also study during the task force and people might know it. Uh, because uh, people, uh, some people do like this one as being one of the disposable uh, nebulizers, uh, which only nebulizes when the patient inhales. When the patient inhales, this uh, green plunger, sorry, this green plunger uh, uh, goes up, and you, oh, this uh, green plunger goes up, and uh, the patient here is here breathing through the mouthpiece. You uh, can see that uh, this green part goes up. So you can see that the patient is breathing and the nebulizer is continuously nebulizing. But uh, when the patient inhales, only then the plunger goes up and only then the, nebul the nebulized aerosols can be inhaled by the patient. If the patient exhales, the plunger goes down because it's not sucked up by the patient and uh, the uh, nebulizer just nebulizes and then the aerosol stays inside the nebulizer. So if you are in favor of a disposable nebulizers, then this might be an alternative. And if you're, let's say, uh, cleaning uh, or um, uh, procedures uh, uh, are all right, of course, you could also uh, use uh, not disposable nebulizers, but uh, uh, reusable nebulizers. 
like, uh, for instance, most dosimate systems are. Um, the dilution scheme, I will come back to this. This is a dilution scheme given uh, for uh, a nebulizer, uh, for a doubling uh, set and uh, credible sets they are given. But be aware that these kind of dilution schemes do depend on the nebulizer which you do choose and on the output of that nebulizer. So on which settings uh, the nebulizer works. And it makes it directly so complicated that I still think that many people who even do know this document might not yet work uh, conform the document because you really have to know more uh, what you're doing if you want to do it in the correct way. Uh, and the way that uh, you then uh, calculate and formulate the PC20, nowadays the PD20, so the provocative dose, uh, to nebulize uh, 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 that much aerosols that your Evivirion is declined with 20%. Is uh, calculated in the same way as previous. We stepped over from the provocative concentration to the provocative dose, which we'll see on one of the next slides, due to the fact that this was more system independent than the provocative concentration was. So we could use more kind of nebulizers in more kind of settings, and we get uh, got the same outcome if we use a provocative dose compared to the provocative concentration. And here you see, can see an example on this uh, slide. And such an example again is given as a supplement, as you can see here in the bottom, a supplement of uh, the online supplement of this task force paper. So you can check it uh, yourself uh, if uh, it's not automatically done by uh, the manufacturer who delivered the system to your lab. Um, we found out, and it was, uh, I would say, uh, um, most of the work was done by Alan Coates, and therefore, of course, he's the first author, and uh, we found out that uh, that the um, uh, aero clips, uh, disposable one, could uh, do it in 12 seconds, uh, what the old English right nebulizer needed two minutes for. And if you use, uh, which some people might use care fusion systems or fire air systems, uh, um, uh, then uh, uh, normally it's about uh, 76 uh, seconds. So it depends on the output rate of your nebulizer, but uh, we cannot, of course, write a document stating that uh, you can shorten your time from two minutes to, uh, let's say, 20 seconds, because then only a limited amount of nebulizers uh, might be used. So we uh, it came up with a consensus that we uh, could shorten the time from two minutes to one minute. Then still, if one tidal breath isn't uh, taken that well, uh, the mistake is quite small. But uh, you can shorten your test time uh, uh, considerably. Um, but be aware, therefore, that your nebulizer and the output of your nebulizer dictates uh, how uh, 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 you should uh, do it. And if you use it correctly, and you should do it correctly with a tidal breathing uh, way in one minute, uh, then uh, you have to uh, see uh, how uh, which concentrations you have to put in your nebulizer for each step. Uh, this is a flow chart in the uh, document, and it simply states as long as the average one isn't uh, lowered, you can go for the next uh, step. Uh, and uh, um, here you can see what we found out, uh, mostly Ellen found out uh, for uh, the PC20 on the left and PD20 on the right. You could uh, see that uh, for 27 uh, patients, and this was the, uh, um, uh, uh, the right and the arrow uh, eclipse, that uh, for uh, the PC20, you can see at the left that uh, the outcome was uh, statistically uh, different than it was. Uh, however, for the PD20, there wasn't a difference. Uh, so uh, the devices were interchangeable. And this was one of the documents which we used to uh, say that we recommend that you use the PD20 instead of the PC20. So uh, the recommendations are uh, uh, um, um, don't uh, use a uh, dose meter, but uh, use a target reading system. Although, and now I have to say this document is already uh, some years old, uh, people can of course think that if your dosimeter operates also correctly during a tidal breathing procedure and during the normal tidal breathing in 
you know what the dosimeter will give to you and you can count all the steps and the time of the inspiration then you can also with a dosimeter system exactly know how much medication the patient gets in uh, and it might be even that in future this uh, will be automatically incorporated in these uh, systems because tidal breathing for one minute well if i take a tidal breath of a half liter or 700 milliliters or a liter if i do them faster or slower then a tidal breathing for one minute at a certain concentration will also give an outcome which might be two times higher or lower than what you think I would give in a tidal breathing system. So tidal breathing system, although recommended in its task force, also has its limitations. Uh, however, I should of course say, use tidal breathing, use uh, uh, one minute, use the PD-20. Uh, and of course, uh, I would say it's an open door uh, that uh, especially in vivo studies are needed to see uh, that it does work on the correct way. Um, back uh, for the last uh, 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 five minutes uh, or 10 minutes before we go to the question session is uh, when to apply a direct or an indirect uh, challenge uh, test and how should you uh, uh, look what the outcomes of these tests are. Because also that is something which people really think perhaps a bit Say too easy uh, or too uh, black white well that's uh, also not uh, the, the correct word or too on off uh, but it's not like that i will come to it uh, for people who are have uh, it forgotten you can see uh, if uh, a test is sensitive or specific sensitive and specificity by seeing if your disease is positive or negative and if your test is positive and negative and of course uh, you want to have that uh, uh, for some uh, uh, tests that you have a high specificity or a high uh, sensitivity or a high positive predictive value or a high negative predictive uh, value. Um, and um, what is for direct and indirect challenge test the case? Direct tests with meta coli are highly sensitive. It means that if you can go to all the concentrations and reach till the end, and you still don't have a FEV1 lowered with 20%, you can say with almost 95% certainty that the person doesn't have airway hyper responsiveness. So most common said will not have asthma. But a high specificity means that if your test is positive, you may certainly say that the test uh, states that you have the disease and direct challenge tests they have a high sensitivity so you can exclude airway hyper responsiveness if your test is negative but they have a poor specificity so if your test is positive if it's a quite low dose provocative dose the FEV1 is lowered by 20 percent then it still doesn't prove that your patient has asthma. It does state that you have a high airway hyper responsiveness, but there may be also other factors uh, uh, the case. And if you want to prove that uh, the patient has uh, uh, asthma like in daily life, uh, then you should therefore choose uh, for uh, to obtain a high specificity, an indirect uh, test like an exercise test. You first normally then have done the uh, direct test to see if your uh, patient can uh, uh, is not uh, very highly uh, reactive uh, because otherwise you, you uh, will do a test a dir a directly an indirect uh, test uh, which might uh, give uh, outcomes which you do not like. Uh, but if you want to prove, you know that the patient uh, uh, can uh, have a high dose of um, uh, medication, you still uh, aerosols, uh, metocoline, then you still can see I uh, can I not go for the indirect uh, test. To get a high specificity, it's stated on this slide, uh, use one of these uh, tests, and I would say almost in order of how they are stated uh, there. Um, and also, if you want to follow patients under medication, I stated you can do it with a direct test, but the better way is uh, mimic something like uh, which is in normal life. In normal life, the patient also does exercise of the sports, 
uh, uh, and uh, 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 therefore, if you want to see if medication really does work and you want to challenge uh, the patient using indirect tests, but this, this task, this, this uh, webinar goes about the direct test, but I want to be clear when to use which test. Uh, the interpretation. Uh, the old way uh, was based on the PC20, and uh, already in the old, old way, it stated that uh, there are uh, some kind of cutoff points, and it stated if you uh, can uh, have a high uh, concentration, then you have a normal hyper area hyper responsiveness. But uh, if you uh, have uh, already have a lower FEV1 uh, of 20% uh, decrease, uh, then it's of course severe area hyper responsiveness. And of course, there are some assumptions that the baseline uh, values are correct, that parity quality is good. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the things is that uh, you can see that if you uh, have a severe decrease of the FEV1, more than say 20% or lower, and you give the beta 2, that we also see that the patient recovers. There's also a, a, a substantial post-challenge FEV1 recovery after a beta 2. The new uh, way is uh, based on the PD20, and again, uh, we uh, 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 well, we now use the word airway hyper responsiveness, as you can see, uh, which is more correct as stating uh, both the hyper responsiveness or uh, even asthma, which uh, some people still do state. Uh, and you can see that those two uh, uh, values can be converted into each other. Um, but what you really should do is, uh, as a doctor, look for all these things mentioned on this slide. Because you want uh, to decide what the chance is that you think that your patient has airway hyper responsiveness complaints, which might be like asthma. Uh, so you see how much is the reversibility on the beta 2, uh, um, how good was the quality, uh, what was the uh, uh, what kind of drugs did the patient uh, use? Uh, what were the end of test symptoms? Uh, was there wheezing? Uh, um, um, there are all factors which you have to consider uh, to see uh, what uh, your outcome is. And then the outcome, and this is, uh, 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 it was already mentioned two slides before, this is a very nice graph uh, once made for Paul Enright from the uh, Blue Journal paper in 2000, already then. Uh, but then it was still based on the PC20. Here we now see it on the PD20. You first start to estimate a pretest probability. You think that the chance that a patient has or not has airway hyper responsiveness is, you think, 50%. And then if the patient can uh, have a very high amount of medication before the FEV1 is 20% lower, you see that your new chance that you think that the patient has airway hyper responsiveness is gone from 50% to 20%. So you first issue is start to estimate the chances as 65%, but the patient can uh, have 60 milligrams per milliliter. Then you see, okay, I have to uh, uh, rethink and uh, my chance is not zero, but it's 25%. Well, if you on forehand thought it would be 65% that the patient will have higher airway hyper responsiveness and with a, a quite low concentration or provocative dose, it's already, uh, uh, the FEV1 is already 20% lower. Then after uh, the test, you should say, no, it, uh, it, I thought it was 65%. I now can say it's a 90% or higher. So you should, uh, if you do it correctly, uh, do this pre-test, post-test probability, but I know most clinicians do like, yes, I have I have a response test. No, I don't have it. Especially on Don Cockcroft, uh, let's say the grandfather of bronchial challenge tests, where we were very happy that he was on the task force, still willing to uh, help us and to guide us states. You have a clear answer if you have a very low uh, concentration. Uh, you have a clear answer if you have a very high concentration before the FEV1 is 20% lower. And the whole uh, part in the middle uh, is still a gray zone in which uh, you should be very aware uh, which kind of, um, um, let's say, um, consequences you will take if you choose an outcome based on this middle zone. 
And here in this uh, slide, I also plotted uh, the uh, conversion from the product from the concentrations uh, to the provocative dose. And I uh, think, uh, therefore, one of the last slides states that it's false uh, that you uh, say yes or no, I have it. Asthma is present or it's absent. Uh, the test is positive or negative. And there is a gold standard for the diagnosis of asthma. Uh, no, uh, uh, the best way a test works if you are in a middle zone in the pre-test uh, probability. And uh, uh, you have a quite nice outcome if the uh, patient uh, lowers everyone in a very low dose or in a very high dose. Uh, and the test cannot, is not helpful when the results are borderline, so in the middle zone. So the summary of the article uh, is on the uh, slides. Everybody can uh, read this uh, in the article itself. It's, the article starts as a summary. Uh, you should uh, know the, which uh, nebulizer you are using and uh, the set uh, use it so that it produces particles not below three micron, more optimally around five micron, but also not uh, higher than five micron. If you know what flow rate then is needed or what pressure is needed for your nebulizer, then you have to know the output uh, uh, for the setting of the nebulizer. Then if you know the output for the nebulizer, for instance, uh, for at eight meters per minute, uh, then you can construct the table, which kinds of concentrations you have to give per uh, step. If you go for the preferable one uh, minute tidal breathing method, uh, you have to use a provocative dose. Uh, and uh, instead of a concentration, because uh, then uh, results will be more alike uh, each other, independent of the protocol and independent of the nebulizer. And you can use dosimeter systems, uh, but uh, uh, the manufacturer should give uh, always the output and the particle size in which your nebulizer is working, and then you can construct the correct uh, table. Uh, for uh, which uh, medication is needed in uh, the steps. Um, inhalation protocol, tidal breathing, we already talked a bit, uh, and uh, uh, all our, uh, uh, as you can see on the last line, all our things in, in our uh, um, uh, documents are recommendations, because uh, if you cannot follow the great protocol, we cannot say you should or must do it. Our argument a double-blinded study, but I hope you can and will follow these recommendations. Um, so uh, the main outcomes are um, use, if possible, metacoline, do a not prescribed nebulizers, but their characteristic is use tidal breathing, use the PD20, uh, and uh, be aware which kind of test you are using. And that concludes my slides. Thank you, Frans, for this nice and clear presentation. I like especially the part where you make the, the connection with the clinical consequences or the clinical interpretation. But I stop already speaking because we have 11 questions already. So we have one minute for every answer. But I, I think we are allowed to, to take another few minutes of the next hour. And I will ask you the questions in the sequence I receive them. What is the reason? that we don't use incremental doses anymore, but incremental concentrations. I understood that we are using doses instead of concentrations and nothing incremental, not, nothing cum cumulative anymore. No, we, we use, we use uh, doses and it's then uh, gives how you can prepare a dose. Uh, and uh, normally you, dose, you use dose, uh, let's say a doubling or a quadrupling uh, dose. Uh, as uh, you might know, uh, if you use uh, doses, then uh, uh, metacoline is slowly metabolized and the tests are uh, that short that uh, the next dose uh, uh, is uh, added, let's say, to the first dose, which is still inside your body. But uh, since this uh, dose uh, goes up in a kind of exponential doubling way, uh, it's almost the effect of the previous dose is almost uh, uh, low, I would uh, dare to say. So even because from the guidelines, we have to wait five minutes, I understood, between the steps. 
Um, yeah, uh, and but that is to standardize the test uh, because uh, otherwise uh, you would uh, could could uh, get uh, different uh, outcomes. Yeah, so we don't. You should not speak about the cumulative doses. The second no. question is regarding uh, the outcome parameters. You already explained that there were some thoughts also using uh, oscillation methods like uh, FOT or iOS. And there is one question about how do you think about the respiratory pattern? Because if you increase resistance, you can breathe on a higher level, you can breathe uh, on a higher frequency, and this could influence even these resistance or reactance measurements, or with the question mark for you. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah no, but, uh, let's say I personally do like very much, especially since also spirometry is going to the first line. So a change in FEV1 can even be measured there on, uh, on uh, medication on some or on a, on a beta too. Uh, that we do uh, simply see that perhaps even at 25% of the patients, they do after. Uh, a beta 2 or after a provocative dose, uh, 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 feel that they have a better or a worse lung function. Then we measure the FEV1. The FEV1 is a change, but if we measure the resistance, we can see that the resistance is uh, uh, with the beta 2 decreased, and then let's say hyperinflation might be probably decreased. And some of these uh, uh, platysmal graphs can, of course, uh, give resistance volume loops. So in uh, your measurement, you can see that uh, if you do such a measurement before and after a beta 2 or before and or after in this uh, bronchial challenge test, you can see that uh, even though FEV1 might be uh, similar, that your resistance is, uh, is changed uh, and your hyperinflation is uh, less. So uh, yes, if you have such kind of patients or uh, you have the room for it, uh, I could certainly, as a physiologist, advise it. But, yeah, but uh, making a task force paper, which should be uh, uh, as usable for everyone, let's say not all, all centers uh, have uh, uh, body boxes or have uh, ways to measure airway resistance. So you don't see a big problem in changing breathing level. And I understand if you measure it in the body box, because then you know the breathing level, but when you use uh, photo iOS, this could be a little bit more problem, I guess. Uh, uh, the, the, let's say if you uh, use photo and iOS and you therefore, uh, during the, the test, uh, perhaps uh, in a body box, you start to breathe faster. But uh, if your breathing level also influences your uh, uh, level uh, in at which, ever see, which you ever see your lung uh, volume is, then of course you will influence uh, your resistance and you will of course also uh, might influence your FEV1. If you're on a higher lung uh, level, then uh, the areas are more open and they will uh, collapse a bit uh, uh, less than if you are at a lower uh, lung level. Yeah, so ideally you should use the resistant volume graph. Uh, Ideally, uh, yeah, <laughs> but I think that will be in the next, I hope that, that can be in the next uh, document in 10 years. Yeah, uh, there was a question, can you say something about the ideal nebulizer? And there was a question, is the ideal nebulizer the fastest one? Um, now let's say, uh, um, uh, this one is a sensitive question because that was something when we made the task force, uh, let's say Mike, this document had something like 30 versions. Uh, and uh, uh, we had to make a document which can be used worldwide with all the nebulizers uh, used worldwide, uh, produced by, let's say, almost all companies at this moment active in the field. Uh, in uh, my opinion, an ideal nebulizer is a nebulizer uh, which uh, will uh, produce uh, particles in the, uh, in the correct size. So uh, uh, I do know that uh, some people who had the old white nebulizer and uh, uh, working at a, a flow rate and knowing that the particles were about one micron, they said, well, I simply decrease the flow rate. Then I get a bit higher particles, which might be three to five microns. Uh, I don't know how much it is because I don't have uh, a, a set which can measure that. They need uh, standardized uh, aerosol measuring labs uh, for that. So I hope uh, nebulizers uh, uh, do operate uh, at a correct flow rate and that they give some kind of warning that if you would tweak or tune the flow rate that they say something, hey, be aware that the particles are not at the correct size. 
For some countries, the cleaning issue of the nebulizer is highly important, and then you should have efficient use disposables. Otherwise, you can uh, use the uh, reusables. If you follow the guideline, uh, then uh, let's say you should not go for uh, a very fast uh, one because uh, between steps you still have the wait time and it will not help you. Right. But uh, I think that in let's say in the 10 years we will have faster nebulizers. We can exactly measure what uh, amount of uh, uh, aerosols is given in one uh, uh, tidal breath. And uh, we sum them up till we have the correct uh, uh, amount of uh, uh, dose uh, for that uh, dose step. And then the patient says, okay, automatically gets a pop-up on the screen. Patient has the correct dose. Now we can blow for everyone. Then we have to wait and go to the next step. Okay, thank you. Another question is about uh, bronchodilation uh, response. How does this correlate with uh, the hyperactivity measurements like we do now the bronco challenge testing and i recognized from the past that if you show a positive bronco delation the response that it could have the same information as a negative like a from a bronco challenge test yeah let's say uh, um i'm involved in uh let's say a few guidelines and sometimes uh, uh, by clever thinking you can think can I have uh, the same outcome uh, and do I then have a different opinion uh, well more less cryptically uh, for instance reversibility in uh, Europe uh, a lot of centers still state that if your uh, FEV1 uh, is uh, changing 12% from the predicted value and more than 200 ml, then it's reversible. While in the uh, ATS and the gold card lines, it stated uh, it should, uh, you should have your value post and divided by your value pre-test. Uh, and if that's more than 12%, it's reversible. But it means that somebody with a predicted value of an every value of four liters, and he goes from one to 1.2 liters, then by the American way, it's an increase of 20%. And for the Europeans, it says one liter, and it should be four. That's one force, it's 75 of predicted, and it goes to 1.2 liters, it's 30% of predicted. So the increase is only 5%. And that's less than 12%, so it's totally not reversible. What should we do? Which guideline should we follow? So in this kind of cases, I always say, take the big picture into account, uh, look for all the complaints the patient has in, the, in all the situations, uh, uh, and uh, take them into account uh, in the interpretation of your outcome. Okay. Another question. So yeah, I, I go. So there are <laughs> even coming more and more questions. This is good. Thank you for this. Can we use hospital central oxygen system pressure with a flow meter instead of a nebulizer? Is if this is possible, what pressure should we use? Which pressure level? Uh, um... This uh, gave uh, some nice discussions uh, uh, for us as well. Um, uh, what we did see, uh, and we didn't like it, uh, uh, because uh, um, it would be, a, 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 let's say, a cheaper option and a, a working option than if you have a, an hospital with a pressurized wall system uh, and uh, pressurized oxygen, that you can use that uh, for your nebulizer. And, uh, Amount of pressure in your wall normally is something like, well, uh, four or five bar is way high enough uh, to operate a nebulizer. So that's not uh, uh, the problem. Uh, the difficulty is that the variability in the uh, wall pressure uh, is uh, that high that uh, the output of the nebulizer and the particle size of the nebulizer was also too variable. And that uh, for most companies who make this kind of bronchial challenge tests or the, 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 the where you can buy such a system, they uh, prefer to have a pump, which is uh, plugged into some electrical power uh, that we are very certain and stable uh, in our pressure, which is uh, used for the nebulization. So you then need to have to buy this pump. And the second thing is mostly this pump makes a lot of noise. And it's some things we, we, I myself also do not like. 
So uh, if you want to be certain that your system works all right, uh, we still have to advise you that uh, don't use wall pressure. Okay, thank you. What is the significance of a low post uh, bronco, uh, bronco challenge test recovery after the bronco de dilation? If people do not come <laughs> back, is there any significance? Maybe you can just answer yes or no. <laughs> for this <time>. Well, uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, there is significance, uh, uh, but in that case, uh, of course, you also could see is there some, uh, for instance, is it could be an allergen challenge as uh, indicated. Uh, it can be late uh, recovery effects. In this case, uh, if we have, uh, there is much more, much more di clinical difficult to interpret information present. Okay, thank you. Uh, did you hear that therapists, so the pulmonary function technicians, become sensitive to methacholine after performing the test over a period of time? Um, Your lab. No, no, no. Let's say uh, formally we use histamine, and uh, uh, of course uh, we already switched over some uh, 50 years ago, and then we found out that uh, methacholine, uh, but it was already documented, uh, uh, gave less side effect for as well the patient as uh, for uh, the uh, respiratory therapist, uh, uh, like uh, less headache. And uh, I have the, uh, uh, the luck that I'm now working in a quite new hospital uh, in which we all have point suction systems. So uh, close to the vicinity of the nebulizer there is a suction system that we are certain that all uh, the ne uh, nebulization aerosols which comes out of the nebulizer are directly sucked away. Uh, uh, of course, let's say formally, when we use still histamine, we had people who had uh, themselves airway hypersensitivity technicians. And then they tried to change uh, that if they had a patient for this test, that another one did the test. Now we have metacoline and we have these point suction systems. Everybody can uh, do the test, and we don't have any side effects for the technicians. Can you use the same nebulizer for each dose metacholine, or do you need a clean or new for each dose of metacholine? No, you can uh, use uh, the same uh, uh, nebulizer, the same cup uh, for the same patient uh, uh, and uh, just replace uh, the fluid uh, in that cup for the nebulizer. But I assume you have to clean it. Uh, after, clean after it. let's say, after uh, uh, each patient, you should totally clean the whole system. Everything in which uh, the aerosols are, can be, have become uh, into contact uh, with that patient should, of course, be uh, able to be cleaned. But I was also thinking you should not mix one concentration with another concentration. So you have no, to that, be that's, aware that it's completely empty. That's what. Exactly. And that's uh, one of the challenges that you should be aware that it's completely empty. And if you are not, you are diluting. Uh, your uh, steps uh, uh, unpurposely, so it, it would be preferred that you have a spare set that in each of the cups are the correct concentrations, uh, but then you have to clean more if your system is not disposable. And then a last question, not that easy. Yeah. Uh, can you please for, uh, clarify the difference between the doses and the concentration? It's subsequent dose of medical in based on a subsequent dose of concentration. I think you clarified something in between, but maybe you can, mm -hmm. as a summary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. let's say uh, uh, if you have a certain concentration uh, and you know how much of that fluid with that concentration is nebulized, you can measure that, then you know what is the total amount of medication with a coline which is delivered to the patient so at that step you then know what the dose is so the dose is simply the product of the concentration over the time that is delivered to the patient and the patient has to inhale it so it's something like uh, uh, the inspiration time of the patient the concentration what was in that uh, uh, cup and uh, the amount of aerosols that during the inspiration entered the lung of that patient that is the dose which is delivered to the patient. Okay, thank you. But there are still, I, I made a mistake. I thought it was the last one. We have a few left, so I already apologize to the audience. I think it would be nice to finish all, uh, all the questions. Can you comment on the Jaeger APS system performance? It's a question from Norway. Um, uh, do it short. We, 
Yeah, we, we let's say uh, 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 you can see in the background uh, we have uh, Vintage device and we had an APS uh, system. Uh, uh, you can uh, uh, let's say we recommend that you uh, use a, a target breathing system, but you can uh, use a dosimeter system. Uh, be aware uh, what the output of the, the device uh, is uh, before we also have an APS system. Okay, and of course we cannot leave without a question about COVID times. Are there indications to perform a provocation in COVID? So it, it, the question is about are there indications? Mm -hmm. Yeah, now, we were very happy that uh, we had a, a worldwide task force uh, running about uh, 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 lung function tests in uh, um, COVID at times, and we just published it in the ERG Open uh, uh, three weeks ago. So if you look for COVID ERJ, European Respiratory Journal Open, and you might uh, type in my name, uh, a paper pops up, which is published three weeks ago, uh, in which we, uh, as an expert group worldwide, Americans are involved, Australians are involved, Europeans are involved, uh, all big names are again there in this uh, paper. Uh, uh, do state that uh, if uh, you always have to uh, look very carefully that uh, the added value which you can get out of the test is in COVID times needed and mostly uh, for, let's say uh, for uh, uh, surgery uh, CPAT uh, cardiopulmonary exercise test might be needed to uh, diagnose if a patient has asthma uh, uh, or bunk area hyper responsiveness uh, uh, it's in most cases not uh, that's severely needed. That I would say, if you can postpone it, postpone it. Do you recommend with uh, to stop the beta blocking agents for a test? For a uh, yeah, it's it's if it's for, it's let's say if for diagnosing if a patient has airway hyper responses, you should uh, stop beta blockers. This was one in one of the slides which came came out of the document. Which medication for which time for the long acting, short acting, and how long you should stop that kind of medication. I do it quickly. What are the recommend, uh, recommendations for measuring FFV1 following each medical administration? What what intervals should we should these measurements be made? 30 seconds, 90 seconds, and how many should be made following um, each of those? <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's uh, uh, there. There was a, a change. Uh, some people might see there was a change in the let's say the old documents and the new documents. In the old documents, we uh, stated you should do it uh, twice and hopefully twice uh, to good test and you should take uh, the uh, uh, lowest uh, value. And that could be the second measurement, but uh, it uh, could be due to the fact that uh, the meter colon is already working more or longer and therefore your average range became lower. But uh, the unfairness of that system was that the second uh, uh, blow could also be uh, technically uh, less perfect. Uh, and then you would uh, uh, take a lower MVV1 uh, than uh, the correct value would be. So in this new document, uh, we uh, say uh, you should uh, take the highest uh, out of two. And only if, uh, let's say, this, uh, one of these two is uh, not uh, uh, technically correct because the patient coughed or didn't uh, go fully in or fully out, uh, which you can see as an experienced technician or which you can measure, then you might uh, go for a third one. But uh, what we do not like ourselves is that if your outcome is an FEV1, that you have to go to TLC, you change the airway muscle tone by that, and uh, by that uh, you will change the outcome of your test. We would like, therefore, uh, an outcome measure uh, more like a resistance measurement, which you don't need uh, to go to TLC, because each time you go to the TLC, you change your airway uh, hyper responsiveness, you change your airway uh, muscle tone, and normally this is about one dose step uh, difference. So let's say if I don't want to be hyper reactive, I first sort of start to. <gasps> Uh, if I would do that before I would be tested, I could at least go one uh, dose step higher. Okay. The last two. Are the difference between PD-20 histamine and PD-20 metacoline? Are, they, are the differences big? And in regarding to this, there is also the last question. I think there, is, there are some delivering problems in some countries for metacoline. 
So are yeah. you still using metacoline in your in your lab? I know you are as I am from the Netherlands. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, we were in uh, uh, in this problem uh, as well in the Netherlands. I know also Belgium uh, has this problem due to the Brexit. Uh, uh, the main compound for metacoline delivered to all the uh, labs in uh, some of the countries of Europe and the Netherlands and Belgium are two of the countries affected. Uh, due to the Brexit, uh, uh, the regulations are so that we cannot buy it. The, 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 the chemistry labs uh, are not allowed to buy it anymore and to uh, deliver it to the hospitals. And that's just, uh, let's say, paperwork, uh, which doesn't allow them uh, to sell it and us to buy it. Uh, it's not due to the fact that it, uh, that, that it uh, is, cannot be produced. It's the fact that it may not be delivered due to this new Brexit regulations. Um, we therefore had to step over to histamine as well, simply be, be, because our uh, doses of metacola run out. And uh, then we had to see if we had to uh, 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 change uh, 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 scales. Uh, in uh, what is a positive reaction, uh, what is the, 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 the borders, the cutoff points, and then uh, uh, the difference between histamine and metacoline is uh, um, uh, reasonably uh, negligible in the fact that uh, the two dose steps, as you know, is our doubling doses are so far away from each other that are there to say, you do not need to fine tweak it stating that for the temporary time you are in histamine, you also have to totally remodel all the uh, uh, schemes, all the cutoff values uh, for this small adaptation uh, uh, that you now have to use metacoline. I know also there is metacoline chloride and metacoline bromide, and also there is a small difference in between. Uh, if you do it perfect, yes, do it, but uh, we hope that we can get metacoline uh, back as soon as possible. Okay, thank you. And the all, all is still one question. Let's, can you use mannitol instead of metacoline? I think you already answered this in your uh, indirect you can or use direct. It. Uh, you can certainly use it. It's an FDA approved uh, 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 medication. It's um, uh, something in between a direct and an indirect test. So the specificity to have every hyper response this is manitol is better. The biggest challenge is, uh, uh, besides the costs uh, of this uh, test, is uh, that if people inhale it too fast because it's a dry powder, then you have a high uh, deposition at the back of your throat and it's an osmotic agent. Uh, uh, it therefore uh, induces a cough reflex. And we saw in clinical practice that uh, in many labs in many countries, uh, uh, let's say uh, perhaps it's only 10% to 20%, a low amount of patients uh, could not enter test because they had that many cough problems because they inhaled their manitol uh, too fast and had this high uh, uh, airway throat deposition. So if you use it, be aware uh, that uh, you do it on the correct way as prescribed by the manufacturer. And if you do so, it's a perfect test and it has a higher specificity than uh, metacoline has. Okay, thank you, Frans, for your clear, also clear answering all the questions. Again, I, I apologize from my side, we took 15 minutes extra, but I think it was very well used. So by this, I will close the session. If we miss some questions, we will try to answer this by email. Again, thank you all for attending and hopefully see you back uh, in January. I think there will be hopefully a new webinar scheduled. Thank you. Thank you, Frans. Okay, Bye. thank you, <laughs> Thank you Bye. all for being there, listening to this talk and hopefully it helps yeah okay thanks bye bye